Hi, I'm Josh McGrath, Soil Management Extension Specialist at the University of Kentucky in Lexington. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about the last step in soil testing, calibration and making recommendations. So we've collected the soil sample, we've sent it off to the lab for analysis, we've done correlation studies and we have that interpretive data to kind of understand what the soil test means, and now we're going to make a recommendation, and part of that is the calibration research required. So how does soil test calibration different than correlation that we covered in a separate presentation? Calibration asks the question, how much fertilizer do I need? Whereas correlation asks, at what soil test do I need fertilizer? And so we're going to go across the different sites that have different soil tests, and at each site we're going to apply multiple rates. So in this example, maybe we use phosphorus fertilizer rate on the horizontal axis and yield on the vertical axis. And so we've got three different sites with three different soil test levels. And we look at what rate of fertilizer on that horizontal axis maximize yield. I want to point out one important thing here. You can achieve maximum yield even at very low soil test, but you're going to be growing off the fertilizer versus the soil supply of that nutrient. Because the soil is always supplying a portion of the nutrient, regardless of what nutrient we're talking about. And then the balance is what we're going to provide from fertilizer based on these recommendations from this calibration step. So these are those same numbers, but we're looking at them a different way. We're looking at delta yield or that on the horizontal axis, the yield gain at that fertilizer rate. And so on the horizontal axis, again, we've got fertilizer rate. We've got our three different fields with different soil test levels. And we see that the higher the soil test, the less yield gain per unit of fertilizer applied. So it's a diminishing return function. As we approach maximum yield, at some point, each increment of fertilizer doesn't pay for itself, right? And so we've got to look at that delta yield. How many bushels do I get for that 5, 10, 1,500 pounds of fertilizer? And that's different for the different fields. So this plays into that recommendation system. So this is another way to look at that same uh, kind of function of diminishing return. That yellow line is the unfertilized yield. And so we can see that yield goes up as I add fertilizer or as my soil test goes up. And then you have that fertilized values consistent across the soil test. So I can maximize my yield either based off fertilizer or based off the soil supply at the far end of that function. The other thing that we get from calibration data and correlation data combined is that probability of response. And so we need to understand this to make recommendations. So we know that as soil test goes up, the degree of response goes down, that delta yield decreases, but also the probability of a response goes down. So when my soil test is really low, I have a higher probability of getting yield when I fertilize. As I approach that optimum critical range for any given nutrient, the probability of a response starts to go down. So we take that calibration data, the correlation data, and now we're going to apply some personal philosophy. So this is where the science kind of starts backing up a little bit and we just start thinking about our risk tolerance and probability of response. So the first thing is there's the sufficiency approach. So that's one philosophy and it says add only enough fertilizer to maximize the yield. So not many people use sufficiency. In fact, <clears throat> we don't have real clear data on what the sufficiency rates are, uh, although there's uh, a group of us nationally now trying to combine our data to kind of figure out what these sufficiency rates are for more precise recommendations and precision ag settings. But a sufficiency rate is going to be a lot lower than what you're used to looking at. Our recommendations apply a lot more fertilizer than what's needed to maximize yield because they're, they're meant to offset some uncertainty and we'll describe that in a second. But basically that sufficiency rate comes directly from the calibration data and it's the rate required to maximize yield. Another philosophy that you might use is build and maintain. Now there's not many people that use a direct build and maintain approach. But a build and maintain says that when your soil test is low, you're gonna apply a really high rate of fertilizer to rapidly build up to that soil critical level above which you don't need fertilizer. So we're gonna have really high rates at the low end, but also a pure build and maintain will always have a maintenance rep application, basically applying what's removed in yield. No matter how high your soil test gets, you're always gonna add at least what's removed so that your soil test never drops. So this is an extreme risk version that says I don't want my soil test to go down no matter how high it is. And so that tends to be really wasteful. So no one has pure build and maintain, but people will work kind of in between those two points. One of the problems with build and maintain is that soils don't pay interest. 
In this example, we have some Kentucky data, and it shows that the uh, pounds of phosphorus fertilizer needed to change soil test P one unit. So that's the vertical axis. So we can look there at the vertical axis. We have the pounds of phosphorus added per unit soil test change. And then on the horizontal axis is that initial soil test P. And low testing soils in this very low range over here require 10 to 25 pounds of P2O5 per acre to change soil test one unit. When I got over here in the uh, higher initial soil test P, so the higher soils, I needed almost one to one. So when I added a pound of fertilizer, it changed soil test uh, one unit. And so on a very low soil test uh, soil at that very far end of the soil test range, if I add a really high rate, I would need 600 pounds of P205 per acre to move soil test 10 units in one year. And so I'd be pouring all of that fertilizer on there, but that sufficiency rate, I might be adding 600 pounds per acre of P205, but the sufficiency rate might be only 60 pounds of P205 per acre. And so I'm applying basically 540 extra pounds of fertilizer just to build soil tests. I'd be better off putting that money in a savings account and collecting interest because I'm not getting any extra yield from that additional 540 pounds per acre that was required to build the soil test. Because of buffer capacity and the inefficiencies to build and maintain, but also because of the risk associated with a strict sufficiency recommendation, the hybrid approach is most common. But it's a gradient. Labs that give you a higher fertilizer recommendation, oftentimes I get this question, why does my lab recommend more fertilizer than the University of Kentucky? It's philosophical. The correlation and calibration data is the same in both recommendations. It comes down to economics or risk aversion. The university's recommendations are based in economics of trying to return the highest profit. Whereas the private recommendations tend to skew a little bit more on that conservative side from a risk standpoint. So you're gonna lo lose a little bit more money. It's not gonna be as profitable, but there's no chance of yield loss or your crop not looking good because a private lab doesn't wanna risk your crop looking bad. So we have this kind of hybrid approach where we take and rapidly build a little bit at the low end. We try and overcome that soil buffer capacity. We get closer to the sufficiency in, in that mid range. And then we have some maintenance as we approach the critical level, we start adding a little bit of maintenance. So we go out past our critical level. For example, at the University of Kentucky, uh, we might think that you know down here around uh, 50 pounds per acre of phosphorus or 25 to 27 parts per million malic 3 phosphorus that's the critical level. Above that, we don't see yield response, but we still make a, a very small recommendation of about 30 pounds of P2O5 per acre, and that's kind of to offset the risk because there's variability in the field. So even though uh, 50 pounds per acre of phosphorus, we don't think there'll be a response, we know that a soil or a field that tests 50 probably has portions of it that we're actually down in 40 or 30, and so we're going to add a little bit to kind of hit that variability across the field and make sure we don't lose yield in those pockets within the field that actually tests it lower. So this is how most labs make their recommendations with this little bit of maintenance. It's all, everyone cuts off to zero at some point, but it's a hybrid approach. So in summary, different labs use different recommendations. This is mo due mostly in part to um, different philosophies of that difference between sufficiency and build and maintain and where you fall in that spectrum between those two endpoints. But there are real regional differences in climate and soil texture, so you need local correlation and calibration data to make sense out of soil test uh, results. And then finally, soil testing only provides an index of nutrient availability. It's not the absolute amount of nutrient in soil, so we can't look at uh, it as a mass balance of this is how much my crop removed, this is what the soil test is, and this is what I've got to add in between. Because we have to factor in the soil supply and the productivity and, and the fertility of the soil.